to see so many faces here at uh, the PPF Day. Um, uh, we are going to talk about how to reinvent SecComp profiles for fun in eBPF. Um, just a word about me, I'm Ben, uh, uh, CTO and co-founder at Armo, uh, and also um, maintainer of the, one of the maintainers of the Cubescape project, um, and in general, someone who is, has a long history in the security industry. Um, that's about me, and here's Dor. Always happens to me. Hey, uh, so I'm Dor. I'm software with Microsoft. Um, I'm specifically working in, container, in the container security space. Um, I'm uh, an Inspector Gadget contributor, uh, which we'll be speaking about a little bit here today. And uh, I think that should be okay. we're good to go. Yeah. So we have a little survey to do. So please raise hands those who are using SecComp in their environment. So, wow, that's impressive. That's more than usually I have for the question. Usually there's nearly zero. So at least there are a few people who are using. So uh, just for how I got here, and we'll explain a little bit about SecCom for those who are not using SecCom actively. So in the Cubescape project, we are one of the features we started to work on is actually how to make SecCom a little bit more usable. Um, this is how we got to this talk. Um, and Dor and myself uh, um, were like talking a lot um, and, um, and just came up with the idea that, look, SecComp is, I wouldn't say it's fun, but it would be real fun to re-implement it in eBPF because eBPF is cool, right? eBPF is cool. So, um, so this is not, I would say this is a serious talk with a less serious goal. Uh, so what we are showing you, the project is not something for a production environment. We are just trying to exp doing an exploration of what can be done in eBPF. So what we are going to talk today about is, uh, uh, is the SecComp history, what is SecComp, what are the problems with that, and then mostly Dor will show you how we re-implemented SecComp using eBPF. And is it working? Is it a good thing for the humanity? Or, or at least for us security-minded people. So uh, uh, SecComp, if I need to explain someone, uh, to someone what the SecComp is, it's like, uh, I would say it's a um, system called firewall for applications. So it's a way to be able to filter out the system calls an application does uh, in a Linux environment. Um, application can be, at the beginning, uh, uh, it was used to implement sandboxes. Uh, if I recall correctly, it was a long time ago, but it was originally invented for mostly for browsers. So when they are running uh, uh, JavaScript to sandbox the application, so if there is a, 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 a vulnerability which is exploited in the, in, in the interpreter, um, not to affect the whole uh, system. So. Um, it is in general used to limit what an application can do, uh, what an application can request from an operating system. And uh, uh, really throughout the time, the main things were that in the original release, there was only one option for SecComp, is only to limit a process to four system calls, which is, if I remember correctly, uh, they were read, write, close, and I don't remember, and, and re yeah, see return. Uh, these were the four original things. Uh, then SecCom, the idea evolved into something more fine-grade where you can define for the Linux kernel, okay, what system calls to block, how to block, what to do with it, whether to block, whether to uh, kill the process who attempts to do a system call it shouldn't be doing, whether to report it uh, in the D message, and so on. And from in the cloud-native world, it went through the way that Docker started to use it and enable access to, to apply SecComp uh, uh, profiles to, uh, uh, to containers, which are run uh, under Docker. And Kubernetes also added, I wouldn't say as a first-class citizen, but added option to uh, uh, configure SecComp profiles uh, for Kubernetes workloads. So today, in general, it is used in very specific use cases. It, I wouldn't say it is used at the broad range uh, because of multiple reasons. Um, uh, and our, our general idea here was 
to let before and this project even to somehow make seccomp more usable for 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 cloud native applications and users and security teams and uh, it's not an easy challenge um, which i will talk about why so how a, a seccomp profile looks like I'm really sorry for, I don't know if you see it, uh, but in general there are like three things you have to take away for how a second profile looks like. You are listing system calls. For each system call, you can define what action you expect the Linux kernel to take, whether to allow it, whether to return an error code when the system call is uh, invoked, whether uh, to kill the application, the process, uh, whether to just trace it in the system logs. And a little bit later, we, there, was no, there is an option to add arguments, filtering on arguments and, and the ability to, uh, um, to use also capabilities to whitelist or blacklist things. So what are the problems with SecComp? Uh, first of all, in today's, um, I would say, application developer world, simply system calls is not a, not a thing that the developers are developers caring about. They don't really understand this language. So if you ask a developer to tell you as a security engineer what kind of system call he uses, he won't be able to tell it. It's just like in most cases. Uh, um, security, on the other hand, security uh, personnel who would like to apply second policy is not missing a lot of tooling around it, and it's quirky, and it's not really good. Um, it's really hard to implement SecCom because you have to restart containers uh, the way it's used, and it's it's annoying. And you, you are not if something is blocked, then you don't have a good way to know that it happened. So in general, it's uh, the user experience is not really good. And now, giving it all to Dor. Yeah. Hey. Um, nice to meet you all, all of you. Seeing you. Um, so <laughs> I'll get a little bit techy here because. Uh, now we're going to actually get to the part where we actually try to, to do that. Um, I can't have this enough. Like, I urge you to not use this project uh, in your production environments. We did it for fun, really, just like to explore this, this idea. Um, so how do we replace SACOMP with ABPF? Um, so as Ben explained, we need to make sure that we're doing a few things. We need to make sure that we're able to catch system calls. So let's do just a quick feasibility check, uh, luck check uh, on the theory. Are we able to do that with ABPF? Yes, we do, right? Um, are we able to filter based on system call arguments and capabilities? Um, yeah, we should be able to do that with EPPF. And then there's the action. So allowing the execution of system calls, we're doing observability. We're not blocking anything. So yeah, that should be fine. Um, can we not define execution? Then again, observability, same realm. Shouldn't be a problem. Kill the calling process. There is a BPF helper for that uh, that can signal the process and, and kill it. So we got that covered. However, blocking the execution of system calls, um, now that's, that's tricky. Like, I wasn't sure about that. Can we do that? Can we do that in all environments? Uh, how, can we, how can we apply that kind of like, you know, behavior in eBPF? Um, so there are a few ways, but I decided to do that the way the Linux guys intended and use uh, <laughs> well-defined uh, uh, eBPF programs. Um, and I came across KRSI, which stands for Kernel Runtime uh, Security Instrument instrumentation, sorry. Um, and if you read the proposal paper, so it says that prevention or um, let's say um, prevention and really are separated, uh, what could, could we do if we, it was in the same realm? Like, how would it behave? And um, so it defines a really, uh, uh, really well where we can take, uh, apply security policies within the kernel uh, um, under certain security functions. And there, within eBPF, if the kernel was compiled with that option, so um, we can actually take um, preventative actions to actually prevent something. So um, a small shout out to the cool bomber folks who have been pushing <laughs> BPFLSM uh, to many different uh, distributions. Um, I see, I, like it was really easy to see that um, along different distributions. So taking that into mind, I thought, hmm, well, that might work. Like. If I can hook into those LSM hooks, uh, maybe I can prevent this so-called from happening in that place. So I said, OK, yeah, sure, should work. So um, in order not to recreate all of SecComp, what I decided to do is I said, OK, let's make sure that we enforce a certain policy. And the way to do that is by thinking of a policy as a collection of well-defined, single-purpose, small eBPF collection, or as I like to call, call them gadgets, because I've been playing around with Inspector Gadget a lot. 
Um, and now we can actually get all the benefits of its perfect gadget, like managing profiles or managing gadgets, like OCR artifacts. It is container and Kubernetes aware. So we get all those enrichments and, and in kernel fil filtering by containers, which is really cool. Um, you can find a lot more about that since you have project in the, uh, in the pavilion tomorrow, probably, and uh, guess some of the talks. <laughs> um, so let, let's understand how I designed, like how we designed this uh, uh, solution. So there is a user space program making some kind of a system call, right? And now there are four different eBPF programs who are uh, um, taking action here. So the first one would be to create an eBPF program for that specific system called trace, within a trace point. So here I can do stuff like filtering, right? Um, like capabilities, arguments that we're passing, stuff like that, which is really easy. Um, then I uh, look at the road trace point eBPF program where I apply different stuff that I can do within eBPF without KRSI, like killing the process, allowing, notifying, and so on. Um, if I want to block the action, so I write that into the eBPF map, and then within the LSM I can block. That's what we uh, thought would be a good idea. And at the end, um, at the road trace point exit uh, hook, so we're doing all the cleanup. So uh, that was in theory. I said, OK, let's do that, right? Uh, so I'm going to use you as a stand, because I'm going for the demo now, and I'll need both of my hands. So important job. Uh, OK. so. I was really lazy recording a demo, so let's pray to the god of live demos that uh, it will work. Um, I think the only benefit of a live demo is that I can make the font larger for all of you to see. Um, yeah. Let's center that. OK, so c can you see my CLI? I hope, hope you do, my terminal. Um, let's start with a really simple second profile. So I've got this really simple second profile described as JSON. Um, what it does, it allows all system calls, right? Um, but for the open at system call specifically, um, we're going to say, hey, block that system call. We want to block that. Um, only if uh, it's not a read-only uh, open at. Um, see that in SACOMP, you can only filter for arguments that are integer-based. So eBPF allows us to uh, actually do much more than that, which is cool. And I can also exclude COP sysadmin, for example, like containers who are running with COP sysadmin will be excluded from that rule. OK, so um, we've got that. Let's generate a profile. So second PBPF generate. I will give you the simple JSON. It says, hey, successfully created profile. Let's look at what a gadget would look like, what the EBPF uh, collection would look like. So you can see it generated a bunch of files. The, the, the file that I really care about would be uh, that one. Um, let's look for the trace point over here. Um, so what can, what can we see over here? So we created a tra trace point, right, for the open at system call. And now we're doing a bunch of stuff like we're going to read the argument because we need the argument number two. That's the argument for the flags uh, system call for open at. And now we can apply the filtering, which I explained before. So if the arg2 is different than read only, um, OK, what are we going to do now? If it's not cap sysadmin, so what are we going to do now? Uh, we're going to write something to our uh, eBPF map. And then if we go all the way up to the, uh, um, to where some of the, like, like the actual preventative actions are being made or the observability uh, um, functionality is being made. So you see that we go to the route trace point, and over here, um, I take different actions based on whether we can allow it or whether we, we want to kill that or if we want to block that over here. So what I would do is I, once again, will populate my eBPF map. So my LSM hook will take care of that and will try to block that system call. Um, so let's see if it works or not. So uh, since I cannot spin up a container while this second profile is running, I'm just going to spin up my container first. So I created a really uh, funny container called I like to open, because um, what it does, it essentially just tries to call the open at system call over and over and over again, OK? And um, now let's try to build that second profile real quickly. And now to execute it, and what we see is that my I like to open container is not able to actually do the system call. It does not crash, because we don't, do not kill the, the process. 
but it's just unable to do the open access statistical anymore. Now, the fun thing about that, that because eBPF is very dynamic, unlike SACOMP, so if I stop that eBPF, so in a second you will see that, come on, yeah, there again, it is able to, uh, <laughs> to do the open app system call. So uh, that, that, that is pretty sweet. Um, but there are some problems with that, and let's delve into the problems, okay? Um, so the first thing that I thought is, well, are all system calls calling an LSM MOOC downstream? Like, is it, is it actually happening? Um, a good way to, to do that is by <laughs> what we did is uh, we kind of like we dynamically trace every, each and every system call that has a, a test within the LTP project, the Linux testing platform project. Um, and that way we kind of like were able to get kind of a snaky chart saying, hey, those system calls have an LSM downstream. Those are, there's not. Uh, and we found out that about 30% of the system calls in x86, 64-bit architectures do not have an LSM hook downstream. Um, yeah. What it means, by the way, it means that uh, for SC Linux, for AppArmor, other traditional LSMs, it means that they cannot block LSM, uh, they cannot block system calls as we do, uh, um, or we can't either, right, with BPF LSM. Um, so that's a problem, right? But then again, I'm, I'm trying to, like, to think about that, whether it's, it's, it's good or not, uh, how does SC Linux or traditional LSMs do that, and they're based on behavior. So, so it's not a system called firewall, as Ben called it before, but then again, you can take security policies, apply security policies at really well-defined places within the kernel, which is really huge in my opinion. Um, so let's see how it behaves if we are not able to, uh, to have an LSM hook to do that. I'm just going to change really quickly to not hook to any of the LSM hooks. Um, and build it again, yep. And now I'm gonna run that, and what will happen is, since I'm not able to block that, it will just essentially kill the container, um, as you can see. It does not run anymore, um, too sad, because it really likes to open files. Um, so that's one problem. The other problem was when I said, OK, so simple profile works. What about the Docker default second profile? Let's try to generate that one. So you would see that if I try to generate uh, that one, I get a bunch of warnings saying, hey, those system calls do not have a trace, uh, a trace point defined within Linux. So um, what am I going to do? Because I use those trace points to actually understand whether I can, like, doing all the filtering. So what I decided here to do, then again, just a fun project, would be to not filter, um, but I still can notify and I can still um, um, take, uh, like, I can kill or, you know, like, block, but no filters are applied. Um, so that's, that's a bummer. Um, and I think that is for the, for the demo, right? Um, so let's go back to the presentation and let's speak about the problems a little bit in depth. So we're saying missing trace points, right? Like trace points are really cool. What we can do without trace points, we could use k-probes, but the problem with k-probes, it requires a lot of effort to, uh, um, to map all the different symbols within different kernel configurations or architectures. It takes a lot of time. For a fun project, that was out of the equation. Like, I wouldn't do that. Um, so. But, but, but K-Probs could be a really good solution for that if we are to implement something that would be a production-grade second uh, alternative. Um, we're saying no, not all system calls have downstream LSM hooks, right? So, so um, I can't do much about that, but what I can say is that usually if you want to restrict some kind of like a behavior, um, so BPF LSM does give you the, that capability. I, I mean, if you want to block file system access, block, block network access, and so on, like uh, um, other LSM do's, are other LSMs do, um, that would work. Um, so we can do that, but with limited, <laughs> uh, but it's kind of limited. Um, another problem was that I was running on H86, my Ubuntu, my, my, my trusty Ubuntu, and um, while I was looking for all the different LSM books available in the kernel code, um, not all of them exist in my kernel, conf uh, in my kernel configuration, so um, if I'm trying to load something, trying to load the EPF collection fails. Um, and I think that's a bummer, because <laughs> uh, it means that I would have to, or either like loading all those different LSM hooks one by one, um, creating those really small LSM EPF programs and making sure that I do all the, uh, all the routing. Um, so not the ideal solution. So we, uh, what we did is we're, we said, OK, let's look at a common LSM hooks and load all the, those. And 
the last thing is I didn't measure performance at all. Uh, so uh, I have no idea if it's performed or not. I believe it is not, because loading many, many, many different ABPF programs over and over again for different profiles would probably result in some overhead that second probably does not. Um, so we don't have any performance uh, uh, comparison for that. Um, but it would be interesting to do that uh, regardless. Um, so closing notes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Thanks for holding me. <laughs> yeah. I, will try to, I will try to wrap it up. So um, in general, I think that from this fun project we did, uh, um, we did see that, that on the one hand, we can to some extent for like 90, 95% re-implement uh, seccom profiles in eBPF, but there are like things that, as Dor said, are missing and is just like not there and not covering uh, uh, everything. And uh, on one hand, it has some limitations if, as as opposed to sec, real seccom implementation, but it's much more. Uh, um, extensible and dynamic and has a lot of things that we can do. So if, and we really, I really want to leave some time for, for questions, um, but what, what, as I see as a very big thing here is that there was, uh, there is a Linux uh, 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 infrastructure feature called SecComp. It doesn't really fit the containerized world very well. It tries to, but there are like multiple things that are really preventing the adoption in in our cloud native world, and therefore, um, therefore, re-implementing in the eBPF, we can tailor the actual need and the implementation to how it is good for us. Giving you the like a, a smallest example of of like where if you want to not second has a feature of notifying you if if a policy was breached, so you can know that something isn't is wrong, uh, but no like Kubernetes cluster or normal uh, environment picking it up in a way that it's easy to export it uh, in a unified way in all clusters. Therefore, it's hard to build a, a, a product on those. So uh, I think that it's uh, we had a really fun way to, to just show what can be done and how this can be improved. And, you know, obviously, I will hope that people will pick up or either will and will do uh, take it to the next step. Um, but but really, it, it's a really interesting approach. And it was a really fun thing for us uh, to do. It <laughs> yeah, it is. Uh, so uh, thank you very much for everyone being here. And uh, that's it. And we'll take questions if there are any. Questions? Too much information in 25 minutes? Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. Thank you for your presentation. So I'm a mentor of uh, OCI, Open Content Initiative. So I have a question. Is there any potential to replace LibSecComp? I, I didn't get it. Can you come again? Sorry. Ah, okay. Is there any the potential to replace libsec comp? Any to replace sec comp? Well, if, if we have any plans for that, um, well, I don't have a plan for that personally. Um, I don't know about you folks, no, but uh, I, I, I want to get now the potential to replace it. Yeah. So uh, um, no, we. We don't. We, we are not trying to replace SecComp. SecComp, uh, as Dor said, uh, like this project is fun, but it's bleeding from a lot of wounds for to, to be able to replace the real SecComp. But it, it is meant to point solve issues that we have in the real life cloud native world with SecComp and show a way to how it, these things should be solved in order to be usable for us. So to replace SecComp is not, and by the way, just a food for thought, we don't have to abide by the SecComp policy. So if we have like better way to express uh, uh, policies than the current SecComp uh, policy language, then we could re-implement it in eBPF with that. So it's, we are not bound by the, the um, current SecComp implementation in any place, but we can implement our own system called Firewall. Thank you. I love this idea. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'll also add to that that um, 
it's a really cool generation tool for starting out with a you know like a really nice eBPF program for system call handling. So uh, you could do that for that. Um, but then again, not a second replacement, not, not a complete second replacement at all, uh, at least. I mean, if you yeah. want, if you want to see the implementation, you can yeah. scan here. Yeah. Yeah. Another question. Sure. You mentioned performance might be one of the implications. What did you guys see as far as performance went? So uh, we did not test the like how performant it will be. Um, I think that you know like um, spans across the performance limitations of EBPF in general. Um, so I guess that if we were to implement something that uh, would resemble SECOM as a you know, like a monolithic approach, not as a profile-based approach, so there would be. Uh, it's just a guess, you know, just an estimation that uh, EBPF is slightly, slightly has a little bit more overhead than SECOM, but uh, it is just a guess. Like, uh, we'd, we'd not test that. Yeah. We have to prove it. Yeah, we'd have to prove that, yeah. Thanks. <laughs>